This shape is known as a bell curve, or we might call it a Gauss curve. It's super important for many reasons. One of the most popular applications is the normal probability distribution. This symmetrical shape describes a lot of phenomenon in the real world. And the way we use it to find probabilities is by measuring the area under a curve between different values. We have to account for some normalizing constants, but really this shape comes from this function e to the minus x squared. And you know if we want the area under this curve, well, we're going to have to do some integration. And this function, I don't know how well I've drawn it, but it stretches forever to the left and to the right. It has an infinite domain, so we want to integrate this thing over its entire domain to find the area. So this is now our problem, the definite integral from minus infinity to infinity of this function, e to the minus x squared dx. And what you may notice is that none of the regular integration techniques work very well here. There's no like u substitution or integration by parts that's going to be able to solve this. And we could use a power series, but uh, that's going to get a little bit clunky. That's maybe how we would do it if it wasn't a definite integral, if we didn't have any bounds. So here's the trick, here's the technique. We're going to just call this i, i for integral, and I'm going to square both sides of this equation. I'm going to square this entire integral. Not something you're used to doing, but what does something squared really mean? Well, it means times itself, so this just means the definite integral from minus infinity to infinity of this times itself. Now a subtle trick here that this quantity, it didn't really matter that I called it x, right? We could have used t's or z's or y's, and I'm going to use a y here to represent the other one. And it's, equi it's completely equivalent because when we actually integrate this, well, all the x's go away, don't they? Think fundamental theorem of calculus. We end up just plugging in for x. So it doesn't matter what letter we use here. I'll just call y on this second integral. And these are, being, these are being multiplied. But it's the same quantity. They're both i, so this is i squared. And actually, since both the letters are completely different here, and they have the same definite bounds here, minus infinity to infinity, this is what's known as separable. These integrals are separable. If you go into multivariable calculus, you might try to split up these integrals to make them easier. Here, we're going to combine them. So this is exactly the same thing as a single definite integral, putting these both inside the integrand. So they're both base e. When we multiply like bases, we add the exponents. So minus x squared minus y squared, that's the same as minus x squared plus y squared in the exponent. And then we have, I really should need two integrals here. We're integrating twice. We're putting these together. And I'll just say dy dx. If you've had some experience in multivariable calculus, you might know where we're going next. This is still a pretty wonky integral to solve, but it's in rectangular coordinates that's making it wonky, a square coordinate system. But x squared plus y squared, think Pythagorean theorem, think trig, think the fundamental trigonometric identity. x squared plus y squared is r squared the Pythagorean theorem, we're going to make a change of coordinates here. We're going to switch to polar coordinates. Instead of using rectangular, we will use the trig functions and the Pythagorean theorem to change this coordinate system. And I guess you could call it a substitution. I mean, really what we're doing is saying x squared plus y squared equals r squared. We're going to have to change these bounds. And in the polar coordinate system, dy dx or dx dy, this turns into what's known as its Jacobian r dr d theta. So we're changing from x and y's to r's and thetas. And what we also need to do is change these bounds. So if you think about the polar coordinate system, we're instead thinking of not rectangles but circles, the radius r starts at the origin and extends forever. Well, originally, the x boundaries, when we think dx, were minus infinity to infinity, forever to the left and forever to the right. 
Well, for R boundaries, the R always starts at the origin, namely at zero, and then, in this case, continues out forever. So these bounds, the R bounds, will be zero to infinity. And the Y bounds, which were minus infinity to infinity for the same reason, turn into theta boundaries. Well, if you think about the unit circle, or just any circle, we get coterminal angles. So we can describe every single angle in one sweep of a circle, 0 to 360 degrees, or we typically use 0 to 2 pi radians. This is the substitution. And so at this point, you might think, oh, we're good to go. Well, we actually have to make one more substitution. If I just gave you this integral in a Calc 1 or 2 class, you could probably figure it out via a u substitution. Letting u equal the minus r squared, that would make du minus 2r dr. And that's going to take care of this exponent and this extra factor of r, because our dr is going to be a du over minus 2r. So if you go ahead and make this substitution, this outer integral won't change, still 0 to 2 pi, but this integral, which was r boundaries, we need to change them to u boundaries. I like to make a little t-table here for u's and r's. Originally, r was infinity and 0. Well, if we plug these into our substitution, if r is 0, u will be 0, so this lower boundary stays the same. And if we plug in infinity, well, you can't really plug in infinity, but if we could, think order of operations, infinity squared would be infinity, and then negative, this would be negative infinity. And we should line these up just as they are. And maybe this feels a little bit uncomfortable. Typically, we like the lower limit of integration to be less than the upper limit of integration, we'll fix that with this negative that comes out of the substitution here. Because our dr, that's becoming a du over minus 2r. We still have a d theta. We still have that r. And e to the minus r squared became e to the u. Well, thankfully now, we're getting these r's canceling out. And we can even take this negative, and one property of definite integrals, if you multiply by a negative, it has the effect of changing the bounds, or flipping them. So really, we could rewrite this definite integral, 0 to 2 pi, minus infinity to 0, e to the u, du, d theta, over 2. And we're finally ready to actually compute this thing. If you don't mind, I factor out the one half. And we could even unseparate this now, kind of doing the reverse of what we did before. There are no thetas inside this integrand. So maybe you would want to just make this 0 to 2 pi of 1d theta integral minus infinity to 0 e to the u du and compute these separately. Looks like we've got one half. The antiderivative of 1 d theta is simply theta, and we're evaluating from 0 to 2 pi. And then this is being multiplied by the antiderivative of e to the u is e to the u, evaluated from minus infinity to 0. Now I'm being a little bit generous with my notation here. We can't really evaluate at negative infinity, but what we can do is take the limit. So traditionally what we would do is let t approach negative infinity here. I don't have enough space on the board, but just know that that's really what we're doing. We're really taking the limit here when I plug in minus infinity. So it looks like we're getting one half. If I plug in two pi, that'll be two pi minus plug in zero, that'll be zero. And this is being multiplied by e to the zero, which is one minus, and again, I'm not really plugging in infinity, but if I could, it would be e to the minus infinity, which tends towards zero. Think of the graph of e to the x as that horizontal asymptote along the x-axis. As we go all the way to the left, e disappears. So really, this is like 1 half times 2 pi times 1, or simply pi. Wow, did you expect a pi to fall out of here? And we're not quite done yet. 
Because if this equals pi, this was the square of what we actually wanted. So really, if we take the square root of both sides, well, we'll get what we want. We'll get our original integral. Quite amazing that the area under that curve is square root of pi. And this is where, if you've ever seen these normal curves and the formulas for them, you'll see a square root of pi or a square root of two pi when we kind of adjust for some things. A pretty amazing result from a pretty amazing integral. Now, if you wanna see another amazing thing, click the video on the screen right here. It has some info in there I think you'll enjoy. I'll see you in that one.